Dead Ringers, directed by David Cronenberg in 1989. At first glance, the faded 80s poster art appears dated and perhaps even a little dull looking. There's nothing immediately eye-catching about this poster for Dead Ringers, that is until you stare at it a little longer. The contours of each face that were at first so defined blend and waver. At one moment there are two Jeremy Irons with the woman's lips in the centre of the picture, and then there is Genevieve Bujold's eyes, mouth and nose staring out from the half-formed symmetrical faces of Jeremy Irons. The eyes especially appear one moment feminine and at another moment masculine. The same can be said for the film itself. Its beginning may at a glance appear a rather slow, if extremely unsettling story of two identical twin gynaecologists, both played by Irons. Beverly is named after a female, is shy and emotional, while Elliot is manipulative, womanizing and more outgoing. However, both are completely dependent on one another, professionally and emotionally, to the point of compulsive obsession. They're joined at the hip, a metaphor that is used repeatedly throughout the film. Another one of their shared obsessions is with the insides of the female body, and shared is the key word here, which leads to them committing depraved acts like that of the inciting incident of the film, in which both twins start a sexual relationship with a famous actress named Claire Naveau, played by Genevieve Bujol, who is a patient of theirs. Just to clarify, she thinks she's having a relationship with her respected gynaecologist, Beverly Mantle, but unbeknownst to her, the identical twins are sharing the experience of getting to know her. So pretty much every woman's worst nightmare. It's a breach of doctor-patient trust of Cronenbergian proportions, unsettling and creepy in that idiosyncratic tone no other director can replicate. The crisis of the film arrives when Claire, after eventually forgiving Bev, comes between the two brothers professing to care for only Bev, which the narcissistic Elliot can't accept, and in addition becomes envious of losing Beverly to Claire. Meanwhile, Bev develops a drug addiction as he struggles to separate himself from his brother, and this is really the crux of the film. Can the twin brothers separate, or are they doomed to be unable to live their lives separately from one another due to their peculiar dependency psychosis? There's something of a satirising whiff of the romantic comedy about the first half of Dead Ringers, with a splash of Cronenbergian freakishness. For example, the weird love triangle with their incestuous overtones and the dashing brother versus the emotionally available brother are both almost archetypal in rom-coms. In one scene, Bev gets drunk after Claire realises she's been sleeping with twins and he makes a scene at one of Elliot's speeches that reminds one more of a Richard Curtis film than one directed by Cronenberg. I will say here that this is to the benefit of the film because Bev's patheticness adds a lot of the humour and tragedy that creates this unsettling, nervous tone of the first half of the film. There are actually many funny scenes throughout the film, but the general tone is always doom-laden and is always rooted in the characters, which prevents it from seeming jarring at all. Then the second half of the film happens and leaves behind the slightly farcical rom-com setup and will have your jaw on the floor by the end. It descends into madness in all the best Cronenbergian ways. This might be one of David Cronenberg's most psychologically terrifying films, and one of his darkest because of that deep dive into the psychology of obsessive dependency. But if you're looking for copious amounts of Cronenberg blood and guts special effects, this isn't the film for you. It isn't a straight horror. Most of the horror comes from the twisted psychological journey that the Mantle twins take and the idea that your doctor, or indeed even worse, your gynaecologist, might not be quite as reliable and trustworthy as you might think or hope. Usual collaborator Howard Shaw scores the film to perfection and I think is one of his best Cronenberg scores. It starts out respectable and intellectual, almost invisible like the twin brothers, and then becomes more dramatic and tragic as things turn for the worst almost reaching the epic dramatic heights of his Lord of the Rings score. The score elevates the film's disturbing moments and helps to further emphasise the dark psychological depths the film goes to. It's a wonderfully disconcerting and morose score that stalks the characters throughout whilst never becoming overbearing, although it does become extremely powerful towards the end of the film. So I haven't mentioned the acting or skill of the filming of one man in two roles, 
That's because the film is so good and fascinating by itself. It's so good thematically, writing-wise, and you're only left with the story itself. The amount of work it must have taken for Jeremy Irons, who was basically playing a one-man show, and the acting ability to portray these two characters without the audience mixing up the twins is remarkable and can't be understated. It's two great performances from Jeremy Irons. I doubt I've seen every Irons performance, but I've never seen him act this well. He's vulnerable, narcissistic, proud, creepy, drugged up, weird, tragic, comedic, dramatic, drunk. It's hard to honestly think of something that he doesn't do in this film, and it's all perfectly played. I can't praise it highly enough, and it's his unimaginable without him in the two roles. It's perfect casting. However, I hope I've demonstrated that it's not just an acting vanity project. The film is a lot more than that. Cronenberg, as, as always, is never too flashy with the camera, but his shot compositions, the way he tells the story through his shot selections, the set and prop designs, they're always on point. So now I'm going to go into spoilers and analysis territory, so skip to the end of the review to see the score and recommendation. What's really amazing about this film is that it's really a film of two halves, and the second half, you know it's going badly, you know it's going to go badly, but the depth to which the Mansell twins sink is Shakespeareanly tragic. It's unimaginable and disturbing in its inevitability. Cronenberg somehow manages to make the film shocking and surprising, and also feel completely inevitable. Much in line with Shakespeare and the ancient Greek plays. David Cronenberg unleashes a horrific downward spiral unimaginable for the successful and respected twin gynaecologists at the start of the film. It's honestly hard to describe how shocking the transition is from the normal film with interesting weird psychologically disturbed characters to the unbelievable madness of the second half. The first time I watched it I questioned what I was even seeing and yet it's all perfectly set up by the first half. For me this is more shocking than the genre change in From Dusk Till Dawn. But before we get to all that craziness, let's look at the first half in more detail. The Mantle Twins are inseparable to the point of psychosis. They live with each other, work together at their co-founded gynecology surgery. They went to the same university, the same classes when Elliot tells his reclusive sibling he should have come to a award ceremony for their invention of a gynecological instrument, Bev responds only with, I was there. The implication being that there is no separation between the twins. What one experiences, the other also experiences. The psychological dependency of each twin upon the other is extremely disturbing and unsettling. It's as if they had never left their mother's womb. And it's clear that the subtext of the film is that their greatest desire on a subconscious level is to return to the womb where they are in one body again. The occupation and obsession with the uterus and sharing of women underlines this psychological bent and theme. Everything in the film is perfectly wrapped around the psychology of the twins. Indeed, it's revealing that the only reason they initially get involved with Claire Niveau is because she has three cervixes, which, as Elliot creepily remarks, is fabulously rare, as he has his hand up her... up her. <laughs> Sexual desire and a desire to return to utero are mixed to disturbing effects, with overtones of incest between the twins thrown in for that extra creepiness factor. There are parts of a normal personality that each brother took responsibility for in their younger years that are horrendously underdeveloped in the other twin. For example, Elliot does the speeches while Beverly does the research. Elliot is the face of the brand while Beverly is the substance of the brand. I just want to quickly mention Genevieve Bujold, who does a, a really good job as Claire. There isn't really a lot of time dedicated to her character. It is more about the two twins. The entire film is pretty much a character study of these two twins. I want to be humiliated, Claire says about being in a TV miniseries. And this is in the 80s, so miniseries are pretty bad in those days. Little does she know how her wish will be granted. She's a masochist and an opioid addict, 
whose life is empty without a child. Emotionally stunted Bev feels the latter need, and Elliot feels the masochistic need, even though she rejects him later, probably because she has Beverly as her baby, which fills the void from being unable to conceive a child. Beverly is always referred to by Elliot as his baby brother, further highlighting the point. This is a film dense with psychological double meaning and nightmarish psychologically reflective imagery typical of Cronenberg. For example, Fear of separation and essentially growing up is central to the themes of the film. Sharing women shows how they want to return to the womb together and how they subconsciously fear separation outside the womb they know they must one day endure. It's a sickeningly pathetic relationship to watch. Beverly's feelings of loneliness when away from his brother leads to him being completely dependent on Claire. But even that is not enough to satiate his emotional dependency, so he starts taking opioids to dull the pain of separation, which only further unhinges his obsessive mind. As his addiction gets more out of control and he starts taking morphine at the practice, Bev really starts to become unhinged from reality and believes that he needs new extreme gynecological instruments to do surgery on what he believes are mutated women. And then there's the scene in which he accuses a patient of having sex with a dog, which is hilarious and that somehow changed the insides of her uterus, which is confusing. I mean, I'm no, I'm no gynecologist, but okay. The scene comes off as incredibly comedic, but put in the context of the entire film, it becomes more ambiguous and further highlights the theme of blurred lines. It all relates back to the picture on the poster of all three characters melding into one. Another scene that blurs these lines is the surgery scene. The audience doesn't know whether they should laugh or be appalled. And those red surgeon's outfits look absolutely insane. They look like sci-fi torturers or something. It's absolutely mad costume design, which really goes a long way in setting the tone of the scenes in the surgery. And in particular, that one scene. When Bev shows his new gynecological instruments that look more like torture instruments to his co-workers, in surgery, one of the female co-workers' eyes bulge out in shock and confusion at the shapes of these new instruments, which is really hard to get across when you just have a mask across your face, but the actress really sells it. It's a really horrific moment when he has the hook in his hand and you're anticipating what he's going to do. The tension of the scene is so intense, and it's easily one of Cronenberg's best scenes. It's that intense and scary and tragic and funny. It's just an amazing scene. In contrast to Bev, Elliot seems to have it a bit more together, despite his weird sexual hang-ups concerning twins. So the one you think is going to break the dependency in the film is Elliot, but he's unable to watch his brother wallow in his drug addiction and believes his whole career is based on his brother's research and that he is essentially never going to be able to make a career without him. Elliot says, I'm into glamour, the art of glamour. Glamour also has a double meaning. A glamour in fairy tales is a magical disguise that changes the physical appearance of the wearer, and this is what Elliot does every time he speaks. His pride and narcissism is hurt by Claire's rejection, and he can't believe he is so different from Bev that a woman would find Bev incredibly attractive and be uninterested in him. This represents a fundamental crisis of identity for Elliot, which he should resolve by forming his own personality and life separate from Bev, but fear gets the better of him, and the bonds that they have tied together are too strong. He goes 100% in the other direction, and tries to synchronize, as Elliot says, with Bev, which leads to his own addiction to opioids. Like an embryo absorbing a twin embryo in the womb, Elliot merges with Bev, psychologically speaking, and Bev survives his brother as he becomes the stronger personality of the two. There is only one answer, thematically and psychologically speaking, for such a choice in a Cronenberg film, and that is death. It's absurd, horrific, tragic, pathetic, and such a powerful ending to the film, it's impossible to look away. 
the last 20 minutes might be some of the strongest, most powerful work Cronenberg has ever made, and it really transcends everything else in the film that came before it. Those last 20 minutes make the film a masterpiece, and I don't think I'm overselling it. It really reaches those Greek tragedy or Shakespearean levels of greatness. It has that same structure and emotional delivery in those final scenes that puts it among the very best. Multiple levels of analysis is typical for Cronenberg films. On a slightly different psychological level, one way of analysing the film is how the brothers function as two sides of the same brain, emotional and logical, traditionally feminine side and traditionally masculine side, and the whole film could be analysed through the lens that this is one mind in psychological crisis. As Beverly, the emotional, chaotic right side of the brain, loses his grip on reality, he drags Elliot, the logical, ordered left side, down with him into addiction and madness. I think this represents a lot of psychological diseases in certain aspects, not in every aspect. In one particular aspect, if a person feels paranoid or anxious or depressed, eventually their entire logical understanding of the world becomes tainted with that feeling. And eventually, if left untreated, they could cease thinking rationally, objectively, as much as anyone can at all. And by the tragic end of Dead Ringers, the right hemisphere has ultimately destroyed the left hemisphere, and following my mental illness allegory has become irretrievably mad. The whole tone and atmosphere of the film is built around this madness, this descent into madness, until you can't believe what you're watching. In the second half, Cronenberg unleashes his full powers of horror, chaos, and disturbia, and Shaw's doom laden score carries it along, getting more and more dramatic as it goes. If you want to experience a descent into a mad chaos from relative normality, much like the recent Noé film, Climax, then this is the film to watch. So to conclude, Dead Ringers is a story about dependency, the deep psychological chains that bind us all together, and how important they are to break. So I highly recommend the film to everyone interested in psychologically disturbing and tragic films. And obviously if you're a fan of Cronenberg or anyone in the same vein, check it out already. You're gonna love it. You will not be disappointed. It's surprisingly funny as well at times, though not as much as, as say, Cronenberg's The Fly. So arbitrary rating time, this is a 9.5 for me. It's almost perfect, uh, except maybe the pace could be a little faster at the start of the film, and I could have done with a few more memorable, iconic shots which kind of all get squashed together into the last act. Whereas I feel like there's a better balance in Cronenberg's other films. But yeah, I love this film. Probably my second favorite Cronenberg film. And that's it. Thanks for watching and have a wonderful day.